It is good to be with you this morning. If you're visiting, we're honored that you're here. If you have a Bible, I'd love for you to open up to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time this morning. We started a series last week called Faith and Politics, and this is one that has been in the works for well over a year. Uh, I, I plan sermons out a year in advance anyway, but this is one I brought to the elders last year in anticipation of right now. And I said I'd like to do it in the month of October because we are leading up to an election here in our country, and we talked about this last week. This is not a series on really on politics at all, although it uses politics to illustrate some very key spiritual principles, chiefly among them the need of unity. But it's going to talk about how are we supposed to interact with each other when we don't necessarily agree, and specifically on something that people, especially over the last 50 years, have become very passionate about, right? Political scientists have done study after study and found that about 50 years ago, there was a shift where it was, you know, people had always had some interest in politics. They also, you know, recognized that it informed and, and guided the country we live in. Um, but again, especially if you can remember then, it was different. There was, a different uh, there was a different attitude towards it, right? Even if you look at uh, debates that happened and things, it was very much, we may disagree, but there was a common unity even amongst political figures that said, we're still in this together, right? We may disagree on the, on the exact specifics of it. And then political scientists aren't exactly sure why the change happened, but then from about 50 years ago up until now, it's different, right? And you feel this, you know this. And so the aim of this series, again, is not to, to really discuss election or voting at all, but more about how are we called to interact with the world as Christians, right? I gave you this quote last week, Benjamin Franklin early, early founding father of our country a few years before he died was quoted saying this. And this is, this is the hope, right? That politics and government is best described as men working together for the furtherance and the well-being of their community. That's what it's supposed to be. But we look outside in the landscape that we live in, that we currently inherited, and it's not always that. And so I pose the question to you, how do we follow Jesus in a world that is held captive by political hostility. How do we do that? And we, brought, we touched on it at a very macro level, 30,000 foot view last week. I want to look a little more specifically this week. The Harvard Divinity School, they, do, they have a, a very large uh, seminary at Harvard, and they do some great research uh, in addition to the Barner Group and things like this. But they did a study for 10 years, which if you know anything about academic studies, that's a really long time with a really large sample size. And Because again, all throughout the world, there's been kind of this phenomena that's happened certainly in all of our lifetimes where uh, the, the, the relationship between faith and church and politics has changed and it's amplified. And so they did this long study and they called it Faith and Engaging Politics. You can look this up, you can read it. It's long, but it, it's fascinating because again, it was about a 10 year long study. So they, they got to witness people that entered into election cycles for the first time. They chronicled people that had been in many, many elections, but the, all of them were professed Christians. And so they tracked how kind of politics engaged in their lives. And then they also tracked, to a certain degree, again, there's, there's a level of, of error on all of this, but they tracked then what, what were the churches that they went and were a part of, how was the health of those places so it's a really fascinating study, and I want to give you a couple quotes because I think it sets up today really beautifully. This is, this is a, a quote from, from kind of the introductory of the paper. It says, when Christians allow political ideology to sit in the driver's seat of their lives, we observe two distinct changes. And again, this study was all prefaced by the idea that over the last 50 years, there's been a kind of a, a surge in political things becoming ahead of spiritual things. So here's what they observed. Number one, they said the church becomes divided at a rapid rate that has not been noted before. We are no longer seeing those with different viewpoints as brothers and sisters who just have different viewpoints than me. Rather, they're enemies that must be defeated at all costs. I think you see this as well because many of you have talked to me about this of this idea that we can no longer just disagree, that if we disagree, then we must be enemies. They must be defeated. 
And again, their research points us to the exact same thing. The second thing, which is informing more of what we're going to talk about today, when we as Christians place our ultimate trust and confidence in a political leader or system, we now begin to look like everyone else instead of the city set on a hill that we're called to be. I want you to think about that. When we, whether consciously or subconsciously, place our faith and our trust in a system or a man or woman, we now look like the rest of the world. You and I are called to be different. We're called to be salt. We're called to be light. We're called to be that city set on a hill. And Jesus talks about this. Matthew 5 and verse 16, we won't spend a lot of time there, but it will kind of set up our lesson today. Matthew 5 and one of Jesus' greatest sermons points to this idea in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I want you to focus, and I want us to focus today on that idea of shining a light. Because the truth is, and I've had many people ask questions of Keaton, I want to be different, I want to treat this season of time better, but how do I practically do that? Right? I've told you before, we did a lesson on this, you, go be involved in the system, go vote, all that's okay, it doesn't conflict with Christian ideology, but the question still is, how am I able to make a difference in my community? I can't control what other people say. I can't control what other people do. How can I be a positive influence, particularly in this season of time? I think Matthew 5 gives us some indication. So today, I want us to look at how we are able to shine brighter in a dark time. How are you and I able to go out into the world that we live? And I think Philippians 2 where I asked you to turn a moment ago, provides us with ways we can do this. I want to give you a little background on Philippians. We've taught in this before. You've heard classes on this, so some of this may not be new to you, but for those that it is. Philippians is, is a book, it's a letter written by Paul to a church, uh, probably one of the very first churches that he planted in the town, the city of Philippi. Now, Philippi is a unique city because it is Greek, by culture, but then one of the very first conquests of Caesar Augustus was to conquer Philippi. So you go back, if you like history, you can go back and find the records of the Roman Empire coming and placing a province in Philippi. Philippi was a major military spot. It was a major cultural hub. Um, and so the people there, the Christians there, which is the context, spiritual context of this, had really three things that they struggled with. And so when Paul starts talking, and, he, and he's going to ultimately talk about being lights in a dark world, recognize that this really beautifully parallels our situation now. Because the ultimate question that we're trying to tackle in this series is, where do we point our allegiance, right? Ultimately, where is our allegiance going? And then how am I supposed to interact with people that may not agree with what I believe in? The Christians in Philippi had three things. One, they had Greek heritage. So uh, imagine living your life one way, right? the, the, the heritage that you have now, and sometime in that time, somebody else comes in and makes you change everything that you've known from the time you were a child until that point. That would be difficult for any of us to do. That's what the Philippian people were being asked to do, right? They were Greek. Most of them were Greek. But then Rome came in and made it a Roman province. So now they're having to contend politically with being in a Roman province. So they were dealing with the emperor. They were dealing with all the, the whims and, and the fads that, that Rome wanted to do, in addition to their background. Then you add on top of that that they're now newly converted Christians. So you have Greek background, Roman political system, and a Christian faith all trying to live in the same melting pot. That's not dissimilar from our situation, right? We, as Christians, live in a world where not everyone agrees with what we believe, right? We have our background and heritage. We live in a political system here in America, but then we're Christians on top of all of that. I want you to listen to the way Paul instructs the Philippian people. And I want us to, to have 
a, a sense of, of what this is pointing us to. So Paul and Timothy is pointing here. And again, if we had time, we'd read Philippians uh, 2, we, Philippians 1 and Philippians 2. But we're going to start in Philippians 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy, notice this, by being of the same mind. Now, if you were here last week, we talked at kind of a macro overview of, again, how do you manage faith in politics? It's got to it's gotta start with a crystal clear understanding of the unity, the spiritual unity that you and I are called to have. Now, Paul is echoing that to the Philippian people, to the people in Philippi, the Christians in Philippi, just to be crystal clear. These are Christians that are living in a world not dissimilar from our own. And Paul says, if you love Christ, if you love the Spirit, if you love all the things about being a Christian, if you love the, if you, my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Now listen to that. Paul is saying, again, all the context, again, our whole Sunday morning classes for the last little bit have been on context. Appreciate the context here. Paul is writing from a jail cell in Rome to Christians that are being told to put all their heritage aside, all their family aside, all their background aside, to have to deal with the Roman political system and be Christians on top of that. And he says, do nothing from selfish ambition, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but into the interest of others. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Paul is, is pointing, he's anchoring all this back to, not only is this significant, but it's important that if you love Christ, if you really want to profess the Christian faith that you've newly put on in baptism, this is how you do it. Count others more important than yourselves. Go and find ways to be a blessing to others. Have this mind which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth and every t uh, tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, I want us to take a pause at verse 12 because now all of this is kind of setting up the this is why this matters, right? Paul, Paul very seldomly jumps right into this is what I need you to do. He wants it to be crystal clear that this is not Paul saying this. He's saying, if you love Christ, you are going to be willing to do what I'm about to ask you to do. Notice what he says. Therefore, my beloved, as you, and again, remember anytime therefore is said, particularly in a Paul letter, what he's saying is remember all the things that I just told you. All the things up to this point. My beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his pleasure. Do all these things, listen to this, do all these things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. I have to think that Paul is remembering back to Jesus' sermon to be that city set on a hill, shine like lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Paul, I think, has given us a great framework 
for how to answer our question. He points us to the idea that Christ was willing to lose everything. Everything up to and including his life in order that you and I may gain eternity. I told you this yesterday. This is not to knock the political system. This is not to knock any individual person. But the truth is, there's no political system in the world. There's no man or woman that can offer you salvation. There's not. That's not to say they're bad. That's not to say that they're not good people. That's not even to say that they're not trying to do the right thing. But all of us hold a insufficiency in the sense that if we didn't, we wouldn't need Christ. But we do because we're flawed and we're broken. And Christ came as God himself, God incarnate, walking around. And he went up on a cross and died so that you and I, he lost everything, including his life, so that you and I may have a hope for eternity. And Paul wants them to remember that over and over again. It brings us back to our original question. How do we as Christians follow Jesus in a world that is held captive by political hostility? I want to offer you a few things out of Philippians chapter 2. We're going to use this as our framework. And Paul, in essence, gives us a little bit of the end result here. Later on, almost to the end of our reading, you may have picked up on this. Philippians 2 and verse 15. He says, if you'll do these things... If you will consider others more significant than yourselves, look at the result. He says, you will shine like you, you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Particularly, he frames it within the context of Philippi. And I know, I know that that you can, can see the parallel here. When Paul says, Listen, you live in a crooked and a twisted generation. Philippi was not unique in the sense that they needed encouragement. They needed challenge by Paul. Don't allow false teachers to come in. But he says, you're living in 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 an imperfect world. Friends, that's not dissimilar from us. We live in an imperfect, fallen world. The way Paul would phrase it is a crooked and a twisted generation, which gives us confidence that what we're dealing with now is not unique to us that it's been dealt with since the very early church, that Paul even wrote this to the, to the Christians in Philippi. But he says, there is better news. There is something on the horizon. You can be like those stars that shine in the night sky. Number one, how are we able to shine better? I want to encourage you to work on you first. How are you able to shine in a political system that seems so out of whack? Look with me in verse 12. Again, I told you we're going to kind of pivot in verse 12. 1 through 11 gives us the why. 1 through 11 gives us the authority. But 12 through 16 gives us the so what. What am I supposed to do about that? Listen in verse 12 the way Paul writes this. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, He wants them to be crystal clear that even in a crooked and a twisted generation, he says, listen, there's got to be an individual component to this. There's got to be an accountability that how do you affect change on a greater scale? It starts at a micro level. It starts when you and I take accountability and say, I want to be better. I am not willing to engage in the things that I believe are sinful. I mean, that's true far beyond the context of politics. That's true in general. But Paul is looking at a, at a, at a city, at a culture that he knows. Remember, Philippi is, is precious to him. He's been there. He says, I know where you're living. I know the people you're engaging with. He says, Each of you individually, you have obeyed, not just when I was there, not in my presence, but even more in my my absence. He says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Friends, that's not to say that you and I can't lend a hand. In fact, we looked this morning in a phenomenal class that Jim did looking out at Matthew 18, that there are times where you and I need to come together to help a brother that is is struggling, that's falling away. But Paul, Paul, I get the inference here, maybe you've gotten the inference as you've read Philippians 2 in the past, that the Christians there were a little bit too eager to help other people and weren't working on them to start with. He says, listen, you want to be, you want to be the light? You want to be the bright shining light in this really dark time? Start with you. 
And friends, that, that is phenomenal advice for you and me as well. That's not to say, again, that we, we don't look to others. Again, when we're talking about politics, we're, we're always looking at other people. But how do you affect change? It starts with you and I individually. Number two, know your ultimate purpose. Know your ultimate purpose. I'm going to continue to point you back to this every week. I'm going to say it in different ways, but I want you to remember this every single week. That how do, you, how do you endure this political season? How do you shine brightly in this political season? It starts with knowing who you belong to. Why are you here? What is your grander purpose? And if you believe that you're here and your grander purpose is to be a part of some political machine, you're off base. You and I as Christians, that's not to say that we can't be a part of that, but it has to be number two at minimum. It has to be underneath the guidance and the veil of your faith. It has to be because your faith has to trickle down into every other facet of your life, including where your political leanings may be. You want to be involved? Go have at it. But it has to be influenced chiefly by what you believe and by what God has given us in his word. It has to be. Or God is going to tell us over and over and over again, Paul is going to remind them that's how people get off track. When they begin to go into pursuits, not just political ones, but any where they allow earthly motivation to guide the ship. If we allow earthly motivation to guide the ship and then we just allow our spiritual influence to kind of get on the margins, friends, that ship's going to go off course in a heartbeat. And Paul is encouraging them of the same thing. Know your ultimate purpose. Let's go back to verse 12. For it is God who works in you to will and to act and in order to fulfill his good purpose. Verse 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure or his purpose. Friends, why are you here? What, what is your purpose for being on this earth? I promise you it's not to cast a vote. It's not to say that that's a bad thing. It's not to say that you're prohibited from doing that. But friends, if you think that's why you're here, you're off base. Let that be a byproduct. I encourage you and I'll challenge you again with this. Are you allowing, are you setting up your politics, your political views to influence every other part of your life or, or are you allowing your faith to dictate everything else, including the way you might vote or the way you might be involved in your local city or your neighborhood or your PTA or whatever else you want to be involved with? Are you allowing your faith to guide that ship or is it the other way around? And Paul is encouraging them, for it is God who works in you to will and to act and in order to fulfill his purpose. We looked at that last week. Paul and Peter wrote to Christians and told them, listen, God has placed people in authority for such a time as this. You have to understand that. And if you and I want to be involved, great. But it has to be influenced by our faith. Paul encourages them, number three, he says, stop complaining and stop arguing. He says, it's not going to move the needle. Look with me in 14 and 15. He says, do everything. Let me repeat that. Do everything. That is, this, this is not one of those verses where there's an asterisk, and that means that when it comes November every four years, we get to forget this. It's not there. Do everything without grumbling or arguing that you may become, listen to this, blameless and pure. Blameless and pure. Do you recognize that the, the challenge there is not I want to be viewed as blameless and pure by the people who already agree with me. Friends, that's, that's not what this says. The challenge is, am I able, are people able to look at me and say he is blameless and pure in spite of the fact that we may disagree? Friends, that's where we may get it wrong. Children of God without fault in a warped and a crooked generation. Do everything without complaining 
and without arguing. It points us back to the unity that we're called to have. But lastly, it points us to number four. Paul says, hold on tightly to Christ. Hold on tightly to Jesus. Let's look in 15 and 16. It says that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and a, and a twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. Hold to Jesus. Hold to God's word. Hold to the Father. I don't want this series to come across as that I'm anti-government or anti the political system. That's not it. It's just we have to frame it in the, in the correct way. We have to frame it in such a way that we recognize that that's not our Savior. That's not where our hope comes from. That's not what should make you sleep easy at night. When it come November, when we cast a vote, I told you this last week, there's going to be some of us that are going to be excited. There are going to be some of us that are worried, but recognize that that worry or that excitement should not surpass the confidence in knowing that you have a God that created you and that created the world that we live in that is going to ultimately come back and make it all right. For those of us who have lived long enough to vote through multiple political cycles, you'll recognize and you know that there, everything comes and goes. But eternity is eternity. Heaven is real. Our Father wants us to be reunited with him one day. I told you this last week. God will come back to collect. God will come back and make everything right. Who wins in November will matter 0%. How you and I interact with those that may disagree with us, how you and I to speak to each other, how you and I uh, carry ourselves and compose ourselves, even when we know we disagree with others, who wins the election will move the needle zero, but how you and inter how you and I interact with others very much will matter. We're told we will give an account for those things. We will give an account for the words that we say and that we don't say. You will shine like stars in the night sky. I point you back to Philippians 3 just a chapter later. I showed you this last week and I'll show you every week beyond in this series. Our citizenship. And you think about that concept of citizenship. For many of us, we were born in this country. We've only ever lived here. But I want you to put yourself in the shoes of certainly somebody like the first century Greeks, the first century folks that, again, they grew up in a certain society, but by no choice of their own, Rome came in and now forced on them a brand new system. And so that idea of citizenship, of where do I belong? Where do I plant my flag? Where are my people? Is harder for us to appreciate than it was for them. So when Paul says to them, let your citizenship be in heaven. What he's saying is it doesn't matter about Philippi. It doesn't matter how great that is. It doesn't matter if Rome's in control. It doesn't matter if some other country's in control. It doesn't matter if Greece is in control. What matters is you're Christian. Our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll land the plane. I'll give you this challenge again. Are you willing to evaluate your politics through the filter of faith rather than create a version of faith that supports your politics? Are you willing to place your faith at the very top of the ladder and allow that to influence everything else you do rather than create a version of politics or anything else that supports faith? Which one comes first for you? You know, again, we look at this topic and it's, it's divisive in so many places. It, it, it almost has become taboo in a sense that we're cautious who we talk to it about with. But friends, again, at the end of the day, where does your citizenship lie? Maybe another way to phrase that is what citizenship is most important to you? Is it 
where you live? Is it being a part of this country? Is it what happens in November? Is it who's in the White House? Is that what rules your life? Or is that secondary to the realization that I serve, I'm a citizen in heaven within the family of God that will extend into eternity long after this world, this country, this election cease to matter. Where I spend eternity will matter. You have that opportunity to make that choice this morning. If you aren't a Christian, we want to give you that opportunity to come and to put on Christ in baptism. Maybe you struggle with this topic or or anything else and you need prayers, we'd love to help you with that as well. If we can do anything for you, would you come let us know about it as we stand and as we sing together?